personal way. I just believe in that movie, and I believe we ne- the church needs to support that stuff. I got a text. Debbie posted yesterday on Facebook um, that we had gone to see it, and I just lost that. Where did I go? And um, uh, the um, someone replied, and, and so I replied on it then too. Um, and what I said was, um, it's his testimony. It shows how it shows the naked eye, the struggles of life, and the spiritual eye, the working of God through all the phases of our lives. Very, it's a very special movie, which I believe is an opportunity to touch lives around the globe, both in and out of the church world. And then a guy that actually his name is Rich Gerberding, and he's in he's a uh, an area guy that does promotes all the Christian movies. There's like uh, there's like three movies coming out real soon here. Paul is coming out Easter. Getting Grace uh, is coming out shortly after. Or I think that's later in the year. God's Not Dead, Light in the Darkness is coming out. And the thing is, to, in order to keep this one in the theaters, we've got to produ- we, the church has got to step out and do it. Okay. And this this movie is one that I believe has so many messages, so many. Um, opportunities for us to glean from it okay um so that's why i wanted to sow into you we teach sewing so i wanted to sow into you today so you can take that opportunity to go out and 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 view it amen um turn me over the in your bibles to uh turn with me over into your i listen to myself and i always i always say turn me over to your (laughs) (laughs) and i'm going i need to enunciate better i understand that uh the uh Turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. I'm going to read um, out of the Passion Translation. As he throws it up there in the New King James. I just like the way the Passion puts it. Um, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And that's the one I always remember. That's how I say it. But here's, when I read the Passion Translation, it says, What good does it do for you to say, I'm your Lord and Master? If what I teach you is not put into practice. That to me says it really, really well. Now that's the easier way to remember it. But basically, I like the way the passion put it. Over the recently, um, I just want to speak from my heart today. So I've got, I've got notes, but I'm not sure how, how much I'll stick to them. I'm, stick, I'm starting in a new series today called Christianity 110. Pastor Rick, if you remember a while back, I, I did a series on Christianity 101. And so the next stage up in college classes, you go to the next level. So you go to 110. So we'll, but I, I just really, I, I ran across that old uh, series. Took it off the shelf back here. So well, it's sitting there. I'm going to take it. But uh, it, so I, it just reminded me that's where I, went, where, where I wanted to head for the next few weeks with things. Because we have to be firm in our basics. And then today is pretty basic. But we have to be firm there in order to move forward. Anytime you take a class, um, if you take uh, any, any, any cl- and, and it's, a con- it's a class that's connected to classes you've taken before, you get a little bit of repetition at the beginning because they just want to refresh you after having been out of class for a while. Um, I watched a basketball game last night. The one I want to mention right up front here as I inter- do this introduction. It was against Gonzaga against Ohio State. And Gonzaga shot out to like a 15-point lead in the first few minutes. And led all of the first half. Ohio State came back in the second half and erased all of that deficit. And as they erased all of that deficit it, and, and, and shot ahead, and now Ohio State's ahead. Now, I'm, I'm sort of a Gonzaga fan because I just like the name of the school for one thing. And they were always the underdog before. But I, and I'm not a big Ohio State fan. <coughs> My friend that lives in Ohio is probably going to write me a letter now. But uh, I'm not a big Ohio State fan. But it's like, and so I was really like, what's going on? But what, happens wa- what happened was, all of a sudden, Gonzaga, even though they had a fallback, they, had, they shot way ahead. They were burning up with a desire to win this game in the beginning. And they just blitzed out to the front, kept the front. And then something caused them to lose their momentum. And once the momentum shifted, it looked like Ohio State was going to beat them. But in the last, I think, four or five minutes of the game, all of a sudden, here comes Gonzaga back. And they won the game by, I think, 10 points when it, when it was all said and done. And it, it was a, to me, it was an analogy a lot of times of what Christians are like. We blitz out. 
We're out moving fast because it's new, it's fresh, it's, it's exciting. We're, we're learning new things, we're saying new things, we're believing for new things. And all of a sudden, the day-to-day stuff catches up with us and we allow it to get ahead of us. And now we feel like sometimes, I'm not saying this, church, I, but I'm t- again, this is basics. Please understand, this is an introduction. Um, we get behind the ball. All of a sudden, we're out there trying to catch uh, our trying to catch our momentum back. But what's interesting is, is that in the end, we win. In the end, no matter what's happened right now, no matter what, how far you far are, you feel you're behind the eight ball or whatever you want to say that as, no matter what's going on, you win if you get your game back. That's what Gonzaga had to do. They had to get their game back. Um, we, I watched a TV show. We have a, we have a, a, uh, in our Ro- on our, on, we have a, on our Roku, we have a channel called Pure Flix. And I can get it on the internet too, but Pure Flix is just basically all Christian movies. And, and let's face it, not all Christian movies have been really good quality. You know, they don't have, the acting's not always the best, the plot line's not always the best. So you have to sit through it and then you have to re- rework it backwards. Because I watched this movie last night. I don't remember what the name of it was. Um, and it's like, it was like all through it. I'm, 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 half, I'm sort of watching. I'm trying to work on, finish up this. And I'm just watching it as a background type thing. But, and, and then Debbie woke up and she's watching. And we're both like, what in the world? What, where are all these characters? What, the thing is, is when I watch it backwards in my brain now, I realize what it was. All these people that were like jumbled mess in, this, in the movie itself were all from the same church. And in that church, there was all these different individuals that had problems going on in their life. The pastor even had problems going on in his life. Almost lost the church because his foster brother was, a, was basically a, a, a drug dealer and stuff like that. And there was a woman in the church that showed what religion could do to a church. It could take over and destroy because she was trying to get rid of the pastor. And the church was starting to follow her because she was quoting the hard scripture. She's saying, you don't do that, that, that. I'm not sure it was even the word, be honest with you. But she had it down like it was, she was teaching it like it was the word. And the thing is, is that if you look at it, and the, the movie, the show was really all about forgiveness. The pastor had forgiven himself for his past. He had forgiven himself for taking money to, to, from his drug dealing brother who had just come and say, I need you to cover me in prayer. Here's some money. I need you to cover me. He was paying for the prayer. Because there, huh? He was sowing seed. He was, that's why I meant. He was, he was paying, he, he in his mind was paying for this prayer. But in reality, he was sowing seed. And the thing is, is that as he was doing it, the pastor really didn't want the money, and he, but he kept taking it, but he never kept it for himself. Except for one time, he went out and bought a brand new suit, and the woman at the, at the store, he bought the suit, uh, gave him a watch and cufflinks because he had given her, left, uh, you saw him in the movie, leave $120 in this old woman's house who had no food in her, in her refrigerator or whatever, but her daughter found out that he did that, so she gave him these other things. What I'm saying is, is that we can get so caught up in what we think we're doing wrong to keep us from doing what we know is right. We can get so focused on, <laughs> here's the flip side of that. We can get so focused on, and I'm getting ahead of myself, on our receiving our blessings that we don't do what we're supposed to do with the blessing we're in. And that's to sow it. That's to share it. The pastor would get these seed gifts and he would immediately push it out to people in the church that needed it okay the thing is is beloved we all have a life to live christ i want every one of us in this room today and all those that have been with us previously i want us to finish strong like gonzaga finished last night they they lost footing they lost momentum but they finished strong so that all I'm saying is, and, and how did, they, didn't, they didn't necessarily pray. It's a Catholic school. Maybe they were praying on the bench. I don't know. But the thing is, is that is they finished strong. And I want us as individuals and as a church, no matter whether we lose momentum, no matter where you feel like you've lost momentum, no matter what you feel like, it's like I want you to focus on the fact that you can finish strong. Yes. That you can make it. Um, um, uh, William Wallace, which the movie Braveheart was about, um, has a quote, and it says, I know I, th- I thought it was just for the movie, but I looked it up. It's actually accre- accredited to him in uh, the different um, things on the internet. It says, Every man dies, but not every man really lives. 
Everyone dies, but not everyone really lives. We have to really live. We have to really live for a couple of reasons. One of them is that, that, that Jesus Christ lives in us. And he said, I give you life, not just life, but I give you life abundantly. I paraphrase that a little bit. That's okay. I give you life abundantly. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we have all the junk and all this? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about you live at a level inside of you that when people see you, when people talk to you, when they hear you speak, they want what you've got. That's abundant living. They, you know, you think about it. I mean, you ever drove, driven by, there was a, where, was, where were we at? I saw that great big huge house. It was just gorgeous. It was in southern Illinois. Sat up on this hill, I think it was in Effingham. I was coming in from a different way from Effingham to the interstate. And we go by this neighborhood and there's this huge house up there. And I'm thinking, man, I'd like to live there. Why? Well, I had this great view. It looked like it had a hundred rooms in it. That meant I got a room that she's not going to know where it's at. <laughs> I'm still looking for that great house that there is a room. No, I'm just kidding. But it's like, it's like. That's so it can be me. This so it can be me. This so it can be me. And <laughs> everybody goes messy, right? <laughs> the thing is, is that you drive by stuff like that, or you see, I mean, you know, you get out and, and, and you see things, oh man, that'd be nice to have. Wouldn't that be great to have? But the thing is, is that what we have is so much greater than things. Things we get to. Please don't think I'm not teaching what we teach. But I want us to be ba so balanced in our walk with God. My responsibility is to teach you the word of God. My responsibility is to make you as strong as possible. So I'm not going to leave nothing out. So we are going to talk about sin. We are going to talk about uh, uh, all kinds of things. Why? Because you need to know. We need to know. We've got to refresh our minds. We've got to know. We're going to talk about the cross the next two weeks. Because the cross is the reason why we get blessed. The cross is the reason why we can walk by faith. The cross is the reason why we can live an abundant life. Amen. And it needs to be taught. We can teach all the other stuff. and we've, we've come a long way. Those of us who have been together from the very beginning of this church, we've come a long way together. We've come a long way since the living rooms of our living room on Jefferson Street and on Wednesday nights. We've come a long way. The thing is, is that we've still got a ways to go. We can't lose that momentum. But we can't lose where we came from. We have to keep that intact. Um, John chapter 10 verse 10 says this. Well, a matter of fact, that's what I just said. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. One of the things I like to do, I like to watch people. Um, we'll go to a restaurant and I'm watching people all the time. I, I'll go in, I go anywhere and I watch people. I just, I like watching them when I'm shopping. You know, just watch people their actions. I like to, I, when I'm driving, I'll watch people walk down the street or do whatever. I just, I'm just, I like watching people. Um, in church, I like watching you, those that fall asleep. <laughs> I really wasn't looking at you, but it, they, they've gotten better. They're, they're better, you know, because I teased them a little bit. I, and I'm going to quit teasing. I'm going to quit. I'm done. <laughs> Uh, I like watching people when I do counseling. What do I like to watch? I like to watch the way people walk, the way they sit, the way their, their body language. I like to see, what's the matter? You're creeping Carly out. She says, I like to watch people all the time. That's pretty bad. But, I, but you learn a lot from watching people. Okay, I'm done. We're, we're, we learn a lot from watching people, don't you? Have you ever done that? Do anybody else besides me like to watch people? No. Now, so, you know, and there are, there are people out there that watch people just to, you know, I watch, I watch people that watch people. Because sometimes you see things that's like, are you kidding me? You know, uh, I, I mean, I know people that are Christians and they'll get out in public and they'll look at, somebody will do something. Now, he, sin or sin, right? Am I correct? And they'll do something or they'll say something and the people go, now that is not the way we should react. <laughs> First off, nothing <laughs> shall harm us. I mean, let's just take that and leave it right there. Nothing shall harm us. That means somebody says a, a word. Now, I do get inside a little cringeworthy when they use the Lord's name in vain. That's it. That's the only word that really affects me anymore. The rest of it is like, they did, they, we've dumbed down the language enough where they think it's important to say those words, you know. 
The thing is, is, is that I like to watch. So we as Christians have to be careful because there's going to be another Christian watching you watch somebody else. And so you have to be careful how your body reaction works. It's always going to be Pastor Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, watching, I'm watching everybody all the time. I, I mean, I even watch my grandkids. Because I've got this little thing on my phone. I don't know why Rob has not a, a friend of me on it yet. It's called Live 360 or 360 Live, something like that. Live 360. Live 360. And so I've got them and I can creep them wherever they're at, man. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I'll send them and say, you need to charge your phone. Because it tells me that their phone's low. Right now for church, put your phone on the charger. But, you know, a lot of times when I, <laughs> I can tell you where they've been. It, it, when, when Car because I set up at my house, Carly leaves the house, or Kylie leaves the house, or Debbie or Mindy, it says they have left home. You know, and, and so they, they don't live there, but they've left home, and I know when they arrive. And it shows me the route they take. And so the other day, Debbie went around, and I looked at the map, and I said, what are you doing over there? <laughs> I'm thinking she's over here, and, I, and she's, she was just where she's supposed to be, but I looked at the map, and I saw some. Anyway, but um, anyway, we'll get off that. What's fun is, it, you know what? If they'd have had this years ago, I'm telling you what, people, the marriage, the marriage, yeah, marriage just never survived, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, my goodness. Anyway, um, sometimes I wonder what people are thinking. When I was about, I think I was, I was not in school, I was in kindergarten, I think. And I, I remember this, it's, it's amazing. It was, I was in, my, in our kitchen at the time where we lived. And I'm sitting there, and I really, it dawned on me, my brother was in the room, my mom was in the room, and it dawned on me, I didn't know what they were thinking. And it bothered me. <laughs> How, why do I not know what they're thinking? This is the, I, you know, I wonder what they're, you know, wonder what they're thinking. And it's like, I often wonder where pe when people are traveling, I wonder where they're going. <laughs> where are they going? What are they doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you all find this funny because uh, uh, that's where it's at. I wonder where they came from. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, I know I'm not the only one in here that wonders, well, what is that person thinking about me? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, see, God's answered that for me. He's given me, give me the ability to think, know what people are thinking now. Uh, that's what makes me a good counselor. <laughs> oh, I, I had more there, but I'm going to leave it alone. This has gone downhill quick. It's not the response I expected, actually. But, um, but you know what? You guys are all making fun of me. You're all making fun of me. But Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Are you sure? Jesus uh, noticed too. He took notice of people. He took notice of people. So y'all making fun of me, but he did it too. He. he <laughs> I just can't see him creeping it. <laughs> oh, yeah? How about this one? How about this one? The Gentile woman. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 15. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 15. Can't seem creeping. Bad. Just wait. Could change your whole thought pattern right now. Matthew chapter 15, and let's look at verse 21. Um, no, that's not the one I want. Matthew chapter, yeah, this is. 
Yeah, he goes, right, so start there, verse 21 says, And Jesus went out from there and departed to a region in Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I'm not here to... Uh, sent to here except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And he said, Woman, great is your faith. He took notice of a Gentile woman, which he shouldn't have. He took notice. Let's go back to this one. Man at the pool of Bethesda. I don't follow anybody. I don't follow anybody. I didn't say I followed anybody. I said I wonder. I don't follow nobody. You put words in my mouth. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? She, she, I got that license in November 9th, 19th, I mean, September. Whatever day it was, <laughs> September 9th. <laughs> you guys got me all flustered. <laughs> September 9th, 1972. She signed over the rights to me following her wherever she goes. Did you say November 9th first? Yes. Anyway, let's go back to where I want to be here. In John chapter 5. Why did I go to 9? I had 9 on my brain. John chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 2 through 8. And he says here, And after, uh, now there was a, in Jerusalem, a sheep's gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting to be moved to the water. The angel went down to the certain time at the pool and stirred up the water. Then who could step in first after it stirred up the water was made well. And from the disease he had. And a certain man who, who had been laid there in infirmity for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, said to him, do you want to be made well? Jesus took notice of that man at the pool of Bethesda. He looked at him and he took notice of him. Jesus took notice when we turned to the woman at the well. She came up get to get her water for the day. She came to get her supply of water. And he says to her, If you would drink from my water, you'll never thirst again. He took notice of her. He took notice of the woman caught in adultery. He took notice of her being cast out. Her, her need. And the fact that people wanted to kill her when they should have had her and the guy out there. He took notice of that. And pronounced no guilt upon her. To, yes, to notice of that. He t if you will look at the scripture and what Jesus did, he took notice of people. He took notice because people, was his people were his business. People are our business, guys. It's our business to take notice of those that are out there. It's, it's, our, notice, it's, our, it's our business to take notice of those in the church that may be struggling. It's our, it's our responsibility to take notice of people in all aspects, in every walk of life. It's our, it's our responsibility to become so conscious of the surroundings. To take note of a simple TV show that you might have watched. To take note of a, of a book that you read. Take note of the people who inspired the book. Bart, uh, Bart Batterson writes many great books. We take notice of what he said. How his, you can almost tell the beat of his heart anymore as you read, as, at least as I read the books. You take notice of the people at your place of work. If you just go into your place of work tomorrow and you just go about your job, there's nothing wrong with that. To go do your job. That's what you're paid for. But you should take notice of those that you're working with. Mark Batterson in this past weekend talked about uh, prayer minutes. So you could stand there at your place, at your station of work, or wherever you're doing, and you don't have to approach nobody. You don't have to say anything out loud. You just shoot them. Now, don't shoot them. He used, the one guy that used his illustration used to go, <laughs> you don't want to do that today. But you could take inside of yourself and go, I think you're for Harry. I think that whatever's going on in his life today, 
that you're at work in it. I thank you are going to take him through whatever is going on from this day forward. I thank you for Mary. I thank you, Father God, that her countenance looks low today. I pray that you cheer her up. Use me to cheer her up. Use whatever you can in me. Those are the type of things that we, when we take notice of people, instead of going, well, he's grumpy, he's always grumpy, so what? Be a change agent. Be a change agent in that person's life. You know, I know, you know, when I come in here, I know Bree's usually foul and grumpy, and so I come in and cheer up. <laughs> she always smiles when I'm preaching. The thing is, I'm saying, what we do is, and you see somebody at church, you need to go, well, Boy, it sounds by what they're saying. They're really having a rough time. They're struggling. There seems like a lot of negativity. You go and you talk to them. You change that conversation. You talk to them about something that's good. You talk to them about something that can change their vocabulary. So it doesn't have to be Pastor Debbie all the time and saying, hey, check, your, check yourself, you know. But you. Not, and do it in such a way. Do it in such a way. Do it in such a way that they don't get offended. I'll offend them enough. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but along the road somewhere, you know, uh, life in some, of these in some of these people, Jesus saw them and he changed the course of their direction by simply taking notice of them. There was another one. I, this is Zac uh, Zacchaeus. He was said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat with you today. Zacchaeus... You're, and it changed Zacchaeus' life. I could go to all the scriptures I'm not going to for sake of time. You waste all my time by laughing. And it's like, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that, is, you know, last week when I was in Peoria, I mentioned this the other night, uh, we were talking about Pastor Callahan's, uh, just for, after his message. Um, I noticed a, a couple of guys, I noticed a couple of guys walking across the street. And the one guy just, I mean, it looked like, I'm, and they may be fine. <laughs> I don't necessarily judge anybody where they're at in terms of by how they're dressed or, or anything. For one thing, the word tells you not to do that, judging by the way their outer appearances. But I, but I just, it just, this one guy just caught my eye. And I, and I started thinking, I actually thought about him for a long time. I don't know who he was. Never see him again. But he caught my eye. And, he, and I guess it was the Lord just quickened him to my spirit. And I thought, oh Lord, pray. I prayed a prayer for him. And I, and, and I thought, did he just, did he start off in life as a little guy? In the direction that he's, is he, is, is he where he wants to be or does he just get up every morning just because the sun comes up and he's got to get up? Does he have purpose in life? Is there something that's challenging him every day to walk a stronger walk in his life? To, is, he being a, is he living a life fulfilled by everything that the, that the word promises us to be able to live by? You know, you know, I think about the homeless. I said, well, they, they didn't start. I said this the other night. Homeless guy didn't go one day as a, co as a kid, wake up, say, well, someday I'm going to live in that cardboard box over there, you know, uh, or, or, the, or, the, or the addict or the drunkard. They didn't get up they didn't, as children say, I'm going to go be like that. I'm going to go shoot in my veins, all that stuff that mo may, might kill me anytime I do it or dr drink myself to a stupor and, and not know where I'm at. That's, they didn't start off like that. Or the, or the woman of the, let's clean up a little bit, the woman of the evening. Didn't, as a little girl, didn't plan on selling her body so she could eat. But somewhere along the life path, they got off track. They got off track where? From what? They got off track from what God had purposed in their life. Every one of them can come out of that path. Because God loves them just as much as he's loved you and me. He wants you and me, though, as Jesus did, to pull them off of that path and give them a new direction. To give them a new ability to see things. My thoughts, my thoughts were, what would Jesus, how would he, Jesus intervene with those type of people? Well, he gives us all kinds of illustrations, I believe. And I know that's why churches have food pantries and they give clothing away. They have all this stuff. I understand how they have shelters for people to live, to stay in. But just feeding and housing and clothing a person doesn't necessarily change them or get it done. There's an old adage that says, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. The church's responsibility is not feed him for a day. And you hope they come back the next day. Church's respons responsibility is not to clothe them because they're tattered and torn. And, 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 and next time they come around, after they wore them out, and, and they stand up on their own because they wore them every day and slept in them and, and everything out. In the That's not the responsibility. The church's responsibility is to change what's inside of them, not the outward appearance. I've often, I read a story, an account of a pastor one time 
that was going to take this church, and he must have sealed secret the, 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 the search committee that hired him. Because it's, he, the story goes on, he said, he decided he didn't shave uh, for a week or two, um, which would be normal for me. So it's like he didn't shave for a week or two. He came in an old, torn, ratty uh, overcoat, had a hat pulled down, looked just like a bum sitting on the f- church steps that Sunday morning. And everybody that passed by him, just like, like, what are you doing here? They just gave him all kinds of foul looks and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, they, they got, he, after everybody was in the church, evidently he went into the, the back part of the church, got all cleaned up and everything, and they presented him as the pastor of the church. And people were flabbergasted because they had, and he said, what you just did this morning will never happen again in this church. The next time somebody is like that, sitting on the, ch- on the steps of the church, you invite them in. That, because inside here, when they feel the love, when they feel the, what's going on side, inside this church, and they get the word in them, they will change who they are, and the outer appearance will eventually change also. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, Pastor talked about these things the other night. I don't, I don't, I don't advocate drinking or smoking or any of that kind of stuff. I don't do it. I don't do it for a lot of reasons. But I smoked for the first year I was saved. Not just a little smoking. I smoked three and a half packs a day. Now I have somebody that was close to me at the time that after I quit, he said, well, I believe that if you'd have died in that first year, even though I was saved, baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, he said, you'd have gone to hell because you smoked cigarettes. That's not even scriptural. A person that has a glass of wine or a glass of beer is not that's not going to send them to hell i'm not advocating it please it's on camera i'm not advocating that i think there's a healthier way to live life especially smoking smoke that will like he said it may get you to heaven faster so i don't preach about that stuff but what i want to do is that stuff changes on the ins on the, the out, that all changes as you get studying the word stronger as you get into the word as you see things that you want changed in your life and when the lord speaks and when i quit smoking it's because god told me one day tomorrow you won't smoke anymore now, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. He just said, tomorrow, you're not smoking no more, and you'll never smoke again. And I said, okay, well, next day I got up and bought my cigarettes. I always bought, and I never touched them. Two and a half weeks, they stayed on the dashboard of my car. I think I've said this before. And I threw them away. I tore them up and threw them away because anybody else to have them. The thing is, is that when he tells you to stop something, stop it. I know Rob, I'm not going to steal this testimony. If you've never heard it, then corner him and get a copy of it. Aaron's, I hear, is not too much far from removed from, and I know Vince isn't either. You know, the thing is, is that, and I know Pastor Rick, he's like blows everybody out of the water with his testimony. <laughs> but Rob got a hold, God got a hold of Rob af- after Rob had ran, ran and ran and ran at full speed for years. Thought he'd outran God. And all of a sudden, God said, boom, hey, I'm here. And then that day, Rob's life, just like that, switched. Just like that. All those vices were eliminated because he chose to hear the word of God in his life. Hebrews chapter 13. Um, our responsibility to the world is to, to the lost and dying world is, is to be there for the homeless or the millionaires and give them Jesus. Now, I just talked about all the homeless stuff. Let me back up. You can go turn the bar, that verse. But we always, we always pick on the homeless. We always pick on the on the uh, uh, destitute, we always pick on the drug addicts, the alcoholics. We, you know, the church picks on them all over the place. And Jesus taught this. He says, you look your nose down at the person that comes in here all dressed like ratty, but the guy's got that $3,000 suit on, smells good, drives up in that, we'll use Corvette because I like Corvettes, the Corvette. <laughs> we really treat him like, oh man, get you in our church because man, you'd be a good tither. You know, <laughs> come on, you know. You, you got it. You, you got what we want. But I believe that if Jesus walked in this door as that, not this door, but a door of a church as that destitute person, some of them would turn him away. But if he came in in the $3,000 suit, hey, come on in. The thing is, is, Jesus was there for everybody. There are as many destitute spiritually yes. millionaires as there are destitute spiritually drunks, addicts, prostitutes, homeless people. There are just as many. But they think they've got it good. They think they've got it right.
They're going to they're going to be sorry in the, in the eternity, just like the ones that don't. If you don't know Christ, it doesn't matter whether you got a billion bucks or you got no bucks. It doesn't matter. We are to touch all of them with the love of God. We are to touch all of them with the word of God because that's what's going to change them. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 to 21 um, says this. Now may the Lord God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Let's stop right there. Make you complete in every good work to do his will. Whose will? Not your will, not my will. His will. It's his will that we're supposed to be after. It's his will that we're supposed to be uh, following, uh, drawing to. It's his will that we're supposed to be achieving every day of our lives. And guess what? He has completed you to do that good will. He's given you everything that you have need of to do that. He's given us, as a people, everything we have need of to touch the lost and dying world. He has given it to us. Make us complete. This is Paul's prayer. He says that he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that is, that is, that is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, to do his will, to do his work. Sounds to me like something like what Luke 6, 46 said. What good does it do for you to say, I am your Lord and Master and teach if, if, I, if what I teach you don't put it into practice? Everything that Jesus has taught us need to be, needs to be operation in our lives. We can't get tunnel vision. We can't get focused on just one part of the gospel. We have to embrace all of the word. We have to embrace the word that we don't like to hear. We have to embrace the word that says there may be struggles along the way. There may be problems along the way. But if you're sowing the right seed, those problems don't stay very long. I'm not talking about money there. But that's part of it. But if you're sowing the right seed, <clears throat> you know, if you're sowing seed into someone's children that are not walking with God and yours fall short, you're sowing good seed. Something's going to happen. If you're sowing seed for some, into somebody that is, is having health issues or, 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 <coughs> or um, mental illness issues, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about seed. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about whatever God tells you to sow, actually. When you do that, and then when you run up, bump up against something that's, that's a, a health issue, all of a sudden, boom, you sowed seed. There's harvest has to come off of your seed. It has to come. Well, you said mental illness, so I said, okay, so, so, you so, go, so when you go crazy, somebody will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it just struck me. <laughs> I wasn't watching. But here I will say this. When I worked at uh, the hospital on the, on the uh, psych unit, there was a guy who came up there and he was just a mess. I mean, a real mess. And... Uh, The, the nurses said, no, he's a, he's, a, he's a frequent flyer. He comes in now and again. And he, when he messes up his meds, he says, but he's sharp. You know, he has, he has a master's degree in, in psychology. He used to do counseling all the time. Well, the problem is, is you have, when you sow seed, you, you're not sowing seed so that uh, you get it. You're sowing seed that you don't get it. You're sowing seed that in counseling, counseling, actually, psychiatrists, the highest suicide rate in America, counselors. Uh, counselors, oftentimes, and I, I can tell you this for a fact, that I, over the years that I've been doing counseling, it's about 25 years now total, that I've had to guard myself against th the darkness in my office, the darkness that comes in to the offices that I've worked in. Because you get a barrage of that for six or seven or eight hours in a day, you have to have a good guard up. Gail has to have a good guard up when those, those parents come in that are speaking all that stuff. And she has to, she has to put that spiritual guard. That, but that's no different than you. You work at the hospital. If you work at the hospital, nurses cuss worse than sailors. I mean, they're, they're, they, get, they know every word and then some. But you can't, you can't hide from that because you're in the thick of it. When you work in a factory, I've never worked in a factory, but I know there's all kinds of 
stuff going on there. You know, it's darkness. Wherever we're at, there's darkness. We have to shield ourselves against that darkness, and we do that by seed. Sowing the right seed. Praying the right prayers. Doing the right things. Studying the right words. Listening to the right messages. We've taught you guys for years. Get a hold of, not just here, although, one of these days, because I've mentioned this, I'm mentioning it again, and I'm going to take a show of hands one of these days. When was the last time you went to Grace Fellowship, Grace, our, 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 our uh, Facebook page, or our website and listen to one of the messages over again because i know you listen to other people's because you all raised your hands on that one i know that well how many times have you gone and listened to pastor joe's messages the last two he's had great messages how about rob's the last one he did pastor jeff the last one he did and when aaron and vince when that their next one's coming up real soon they don't know who's who and wins when but that is you know when those happen why not why aren't you because the word is just as strong here. But you listen to good messages. You get a hold of that word. You get a hold of somebody's word that says, I need to hear that. I gave away a whole series of Keith Moore's uh, CDs the other day in my office. But someone that needed to hear what he had to say about the, whole, the Holy Spirit. I gave it. I said, here, freely given to me. I'm freely giving it to you. I don't want it back. Pass it on to somebody else when you're done. The thing is, is that we have to get a hold of that seed. Seed time and harvest. Ma uh, Matthew chapter. We, we're here to change the world. What am I doing on time? We're here to change the world. You and I are here to change the world. Turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Put your finger there and then go back and hit Mark 16. Same scenario, same thing. Different peoples hear different things, see different things, and they record it different. It's the same thing said differently. Oh, you can't. See, there's where you can't put your finger, girls and guys. When you use electronic devices, you can only go to one place. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, according to these passages, it's our responsibility to change the world. It goes on. Let's go back here to Matthew 1st, 28. We're going to look at verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. He's saying, I've invested my time in you. Now you go invest it in somebody else. I've sowed my seeds into you, <coughs> my, the seed of my word in you. Now you go and sow it to somebody else. He's saying, that's your responsibility. He said, he goes back up here, go, therefore. He didn't say stop. You know, I... I uh, that's a command. Would you not say that's a command? We call it the Great Commission, but it's a command. You know, when I, when I joined the military, do you, do you, Rob or Danny or Joe, you remember what we actually said when we lifted our right hand up to swear allegiance to the country? <laughs> Anybody remember? I know I've got it somewhere, but I, I need to write it down. And it's because they ask us to do that. They ask anyone who goes to the military to swear, you defend uh, the United States. Uphold the Constitution. Uphold the Constitution. Support. Uh, I mean, uh, uh. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to uphold and, and defend the United States from, friend, uh, from fo foreign and domestic. And they never ask us to retract that statement. That was a, that was a vow I made. That was a vow I made that I was never asked to retract. And I'm not going to retract. I'm, I'm here to defend. I used to say years ago, my brother wasn't in the military, never been in the military. And I thought, well, if anything had ever happened after I'd gotten out of the military, I'd go in before I'd let him go in because he doesn't know anything about military. So I'll just go, you know. And then, and like when, when Rob went in, I thought, well, I wish I could go in and study him or this, that, and the other. And now they won't take me. They say I'm too old. I'm not sure what that means. But... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, it's like, he said, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. That's our responsibility, to change the world, to change people's lives. Now, go back to Mark, and he says here in Mark chapter 16, and G in verse starting in 15, and he said to them, go into all the world. Oh, look at that. Preach the gospel to every creature. I like the way Pastor Callan started out his ministry. He taught the chickens. 
he preached to chickens when he was a little boy. He says, and he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be, con will be condemned. And these are the signs that follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means harm them, and they, lay, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That changes the world. When we start walking in what Jesus told us to do, we start laying hands on people and people are being healed. That changes the world. It changes their world at least. It changes the world, their immediate world around them also. You know, Rick's sister-in-law has been changed. And those that hear that testimony, because I know she would tell him uh, in the middle of it all, she says, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to, I'm getting through, I don't remember the exact words he would say, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to get through this. She trusted God, and God came through. You know, we Sue's rapid recovery. Why? Because God's in the midst of that. We're not saying don't get surgeries. We're not saying any of that. We're not saying not take your medicine. What we're saying is trust God, and then do the, what needs to be done also. Get it. If it's weighing too heavy on you, you can't get beyond it, and then do it. Take care of it. Jesus changed the world. The disciples changed the world. Martin Luther tagged up. A feces on the church door and he changed the world. Changed the dynamics or we'd all be uh, having Holy Communion today and, and genuflex it all the way through. I'm not picking on the Catholics at all. I love many Catholics. My daughter was back there. She'd come and beat me upside the head. Um, great, great, the Great Awakenings changed the world. The Jesus Movement changed America. It changed the world. Several other things have changed the world a long way. But we, you and I, the churches of Morton, the churches of Central Illinois, the churches of State of Illinois, the churches of the Midwest, etc., brought it on out. You and I must find our way to change the world. Because Jesus has commissioned us. Our responsibility is to be change the world. Mark Batterson says this in a just recent day 28 of your book says, uh, on the just uh, quit praying says says we Christians he said we so I put Christians in parentheses should be uh, more known for what we're for than what we're against. But Christians through religion have been taught to hate and to say this is what we're against. I want to teach like Danita told us years ago. Uh, it just always resonates in me. How do you know the 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 real from the fake? And she said that they teach bank tellers. To feel the real and the fake. They put the real one in their hand. Get them to understand what that feels like. And they put the fake one in their hand. And say there's a difference. We the church have to teach what's real. We don't have to teach hate. We don't have to teach uh, things that put people down. We have to teach what's real. The real things of God are love. Faith. Mercy. Now here's an interesting fact. And I'm not going to turn these. I'm running out of time. You, uh, hate never does anything but produce hate. Oh, thing hate can do. We look in our world today. We're divided in every aspect of this world today. Hate and love, and hate and love, and hate. And sometimes they they think it's love, and it's really hate. You know, Debbie does a great teaching every um, every Sunday, every Sunday. Uh, sometimes this Car Carly does it too. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I had Carly wanted to go get something for me after church the other night, and I called her back, and she thought she was going to get quick, get quick into, quick into do the offering on Pastor Callahan's tonight. <laughs> um, we teach you to tithe. We've taught you know, this church is a tither. Uh, no, everybody does an amazing job. I understand that. That's what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. I you know what? <laughs> Carly asked me the other day, can I quicken somebody to do offering? <laughs> and I said, No, I don't think we should do that because then everybody's gonna wait quick and everybody and I don't want no reverse quickenings happening anyway. <laughs> well, let me get back to what I'm saying. I gotta quit. I gotta quit. I gotta close. And they got a lot I want to get to yet. Debbie teaches, all teach. <laughs> Everybody that gets up here to teach, offering, does a great job. Am we, we all clear? Okay. <laughs> we as a church tithe. We as a church sow seed. I just sowed uh, some seed to uh, someone that's going to El Salvador to do some mission work. Sowed it from our church. 
to them to help make. Why? Because I want you to be able to go to Kenya when that door opens. I want you to be able to go to Ghana. How that happens is we sow outside the church to someone not in our organization that's going doing a work in the missions. Amen? Um, felt I didn't do it just because I felt that was what the Lord told me to do, so I did it. But if we're sowing just to reap a blessing, then we're wrong. We're sowing to get good seed and good harvest in it. Grace is, in the, in the New King James translation, is used, the word grace is used 126 times. Uh, love is used 106 times. Faith is used 264 times. And it's even broader in the Passion translation. But forgiveness is a vital key to your walk with God. Walking in forgiveness is important. Um, you're going to find that as you go see that movie. Remember, if you don't spend that $20 on the movie, you're sinning, Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm just joking. You're not sinning, but I'll find out. Um, <laughs> don't friend him on 360 Live. No, because I'll ask you, hey, hey, how'd you like the movie? Oh, I liked it a lot. Really good movie. Well, what, 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 what did it do in this part here? What did they do? <laughs> no, that's the reason why I know that if they don't see it, they're going to sin because they're not going to be telling, telling me the truth. I know, I know Rob's going. <laughs> I know Rob's going. Anyway, all right, all right, leave it alone. I'm sorry. Sort of. I told you I want to pick on anybody anymore. Um, yeah. You know, we have to folk major in, on, quit majoring on minors. We're not talking, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about if you do, quit majoring on minors. Focus on the things of God. Quit worrying about what's not working for you and start proclaiming and expressing what is working for you. That's what the testimony is about. That's what it is. Is when, we, when you start testifying of the littlest things. You start testifying of the victory, no matter how small. I woke up on time this morning and got to work on time. <laughs> Dean is going, why is he looking at me? And so is Sheila. <laughs> but the thing is, is that when you do that, you are sowing seed into the things that are going to motivate you to, to realize God's at work in your life. Because like Debbie said, there is a, I read that too, where the miracles that are happening just as you're sitting here, the fact that you're breathing, the fact that you're ex inhaling oxygen and exhaling helium. <laughs> helium. Whatever it is. <laughs> Hydrogen. I started with an H. Is that right? I don't think it's exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we exhaling? You Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. I knew it was right. Just like helium. <laughs> <laughs> Hot air. <laughs> now he's talking about my message. <laughs> All right, listen. I want you this week. I'm going to challenge you too. I want you to list. I want you to list all the blessings that God, at the end of your day, I want you to list. If you, if you don't want to write it down, I suggest you write it down. If you don't want to write it down, mental, go through a mental note of every blessing God's got. And, and I want you to think with pinpoint like a surgeon does with a, sca a scalpel. I want you to just, just get to the very minimal thing. The thing that's just like a sliver of blessing in your life that day. What God's done in your life. Because it's on those things that we build where you're going. You can't build the future on the failures of the past. Or on the frustrations of the day. You can only build, them on, build it on what God's doing and saying. He is at work in my life. I can believe him for this because he did this. That's what David did. All sounds real exciting, the lion and the bear and then Goliath. But you know what? David, was, he only listed those. Because those are the ones that took him to where he could get to Goliath. But he didn't start back here where God saved him for this. Or God did this. Or God did that. He didn't, he didn't list the fact that God laid his hand on him through the anointing of Samuel. And proclaimed him king at 16, 15, 16 years old. He didn't say that. But he said he was reminded. Remind himself. And when you ever are in a battle, remind yourself of the previous victories. Amen? When you do that, and I want so every day this week, I want you to mental note, preferably to write it down, 
a list of everything that day that God's done and what he's done th in you and through you that day. Okay? Saying, Pastor Bob, that's exhausting. No, it doesn't take long to write down stuff. Just scratch, put it on a piece of scratch paper next to your bed. Before you go to sleep, before you turn the light off to go to sleep, oh, there's that pad of paper. I need to write down all the blessings of God today. It's amazing what God will quicken to your memory. Well, I didn't think about that being a blessing, Pastor Bob, but it was. I didn't think about that, God, but it was. See, so today you can already start. Somebody paid your way to the movie. All right? All right. If you have a need of prayer today, we're going to be in the series. Next week we're going to start talking about the cross. Um, where Jesus is headed to the cross. next Because next week is Palm Sunday. I know it's listed as a quickening. So the only quickening that really, really may happen is if I'm up here and I think I need help and I may call somebody up to preach with me next week. Otherwise, if I don't do that, then I'm going to shift the quickening shift the quickening to another another Debbie. Yeah. Now she's up here. Help. <laughs> you, you all help today. See, the thing is, I, what I learned today <coughs> is all of your helpers today, everybody was involved. <laughs> so, so when I call on you next week, don't be telling me I can't do it. You've been doing it all day today. I love you guys. Have a fantastic